Syrian peace conference. What hope does it offer? In the interview, Syrian philosopher and human rights advocate Sadiq Al Azam. Sadiq Jalal Al Azam, you are one of the outstanding intellectuals in Syria and have been for several decades now. You are a member of a very well established Damascus family with a very long tradition, and you have supported the uprising against Bashar al Assad from the very beginning, an uprising that was linked with great idealism. To what extent for you as a person has that idealism been replaced by dismay or possibly even despair? Despair, no. Uh, dismay, uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> and I am aware from my uh, knowledge of other revolutions, other cases in, in, in history, that the beginning is never fulfilled completely in the course of the, uh, of the revolution. And that the revolution takes uh, turns and uh, have regressions and, and, and jumps in a way that remain unpredictable uh, when you start it. So, you know, and there are unintended consequences to all these uh, actions. Uh, this tempers my understanding of the revolution and prevents me from despairing uh, uh, f from it. And when you say d dismay, yes, despair, no, I'm a little bit surprised because I know you haven't been back to Syria since the uprising began, but you must have direct and indirect contacts with a lot of people in Syria. What are they telling you about the situation on the ground? Well, the situation has you know, many facets. The humanitarian situation is, of course, absolutely awful. Uh, most of my contacts are in, in Damascus. Damascus is, uh, the situation is more tolerable uh, than uh, other, uh, other places. And of course the uh, regime co continues its uh, campaign uh, uh, of, uh, you know, bombing and throwing, you know, TNT barrels on, 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 on top of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, there are some horrific stories that uh, uh, you hear about uh, families and children and so on. And now especially that the regime, after capitulating, capitulating on the uh, chemical uh, weapons, has turned to a different uh, uh, kind of lethal weapon, uh, uh, namely siege and starve. Okay? with the motto of starve or kneel, starve or submit. And this is, of course, you know, uh, leaving a, a, a lot of people in very, very mm -hmm. dire well, and difficult situations. Given what you're, giving, given what you're saying about the, the, the very cruel war-like war strategies that are being used by the regime, we're only days away now from what's being called Geneva II, a second round of what are being termed peace talks for Syria, an attempt to bring the warring parties together to move towards some kind of transitional government. Is that possible with the regime at the table at those talks in Geneva? Well, this is, you know, the big, uh, the, the big questions, whether the regime would at all accept the kind of agenda that Ban Ki-moon has uh, uh, put forward, namely forming that body, ruling body with full authority and so on. And all the uh, signals coming out of uh, Damascus is that, uh, to, to, you know, to, 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 to put it farcically, uh, is that the president has already won the elections and is already, you know... Uh, uh, what, what, what do you mean by that, that the president has already won the elections? Yeah, and the, you know, the, the Minister of uh, Information has mm -hmm. made statements like that the people have already chosen uh, uh, Bashar to be president and he's, you know, he certainly no one is going to uh, Geneva to cede uh, or uh, give up any powers. Mm -hmm. And the history of these peace processes 
is, is not very salutary. Not, mm -hmm. you know, we know they can, it can become uh, the peace, the process becomes everything and the goal nothing very the, uh, very very easily i know that there are in the in opposition circles there are great concerns grave concerns about c exactly that kind of development that you are talking about the goal still remains for the opposition to remove bashar al-assad from power how can that goal be achieved because it looks less likely now than it did a year ago far less likely well i think uh, once uh, the chemical weapons have been removed out of syria I think Bashar becomes useless. He still can, the Assad and the Assad family, can really rule Syria. Mm -hmm. So they become, but, you know. But the but, but the Assad clan, their argument is that they are the only the, the, they are the only people who can prevent Syria from descending into maybe a failed state where large parts of Syria. Well, it's already are a failed state. I mean, descending more than, more than that into a failed state is, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, but if, if six million people have been or have been forced from their homes internally, two million people have yeah, been well, forced to leave the country. Yeah, well, that's what I would call country. a failed There's, state. The rule yeah. of law is breaking down. People are starving, as you have said. Yeah. And, that is a and, failed and, state. And there the are, market. you know, there are going to be uh, vendettas mm -hmm. and, you know, the culture of vendettas in our societies is very strong. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, even if G Geneva succeeds in setting up uh, this authority uh, or body that, uh, with full authority, mm -hmm. uh, okay, whether you can, you know, uh, make it work without actually sending troops like the French went into Mali mm -hmm. or went into Central uh, Africa mm -hmm. is, I think, uh, questionable. It's, uh, th there's the Geneva process on the one hand, and I, I must insist that there's the reality on the ground uh, on the other hand. I mean, for a long time, you know, for, for decades, one of the narratives that people were so proud of in Syria, both ancient and modern, was that people of different tribes, people of different ethnicities, people of different religions, even different ideologies, lived side by side. Now people are talking about the breakdown of, of your country. They're talking about the balkanization of your country. Well, the breakdown, uh, is, you know, is uh, primarily along uh, the, the Fisher line. Okay, the uh, is basically Sunni uh, Alawi. Uh, none of the other communities, unlike say in Lebanon and, and Iraq, has mobilized itself to fight the other community. And none of the communities mobilized itself to fight on the side of the regime except the Alawis, okay? And of course, the backbone of the revolution are the, the, uh, the Sunnah, mm. okay? Uh, so, you know, the uh, uh, Christians, the Ismailis, the Circassians, and so on, are the Kurds, okay, are looking after themselves. Mm and uh, trying to, at best, if they have arms, to protect their turf, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. With these, I think, putting Syria back together is easier than with the uh, uh, Alawi-Sunni uh, 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 fight. This is why I think, in, you know, in, in, uh, for Ibrahimi, when he did Taif to end the Lebanese uh, uh, civil war. Can you, ex can you explain that for our viewers a little bit more, what you're referring to there? Yeah, the, no. you know, the, at the end, the end of the uh, Lebanese civil war, uh, the arrangement that they, you know, came out uh, was formally under the title of there was no victor on either side. But in effect, what happened was the defeat of what was then called political Maronitism in Lebanon, okay? And the hegemony of Maronitism over uh, 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 Lebanon. I, I think uh, in, in Syria, you need a, also a, uh, an issue or a result that is similar where there is an end, maybe in the name of there is no victor and so on, but mm -hmm. an end to political Alawitism. 
not the Alawis themselves, mm-hmm. okay, but political Alawism and its hegemony over practically everything in the life of, uh, mm-hmm. uh, of, of Syria. Okay, point taken. I'd like to, be, 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 before we conclude, I'd like to ask you about the Arab Spring in general, because you have been one of the sort of the spiritual uh, fathers of, this, of the Arab Spring, I think it's fair to say. T- tell me what your assessment is now of what has been achieved and what hasn't been achieved. Well, um, one thing that the Arab Spring uh, did is that the sense of blockage and siege and the sense of stagnation and decay, okay, has disappeared mm-hmm. and it broke the, the, the barrier that for, for the last at least quarter century, uh, the, the sense of being, you know, block, blockaded historically, going nowhere, drifting, uh, at least this is one achievement that the Arab Spring has been able to uh, uh, to, con- to, to conclude, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. feeling that even you know in, in a place like like Iraq, at least now uh, Iraq can uh, evolve, and even if you know in a violent way, and d- 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 develop according to its own uh, rhythm. And according to its, uh, you know, all its its own tempo, mm-hmm. rather than you know having a, someone like Saddam Hussein sitting up there and blocking everything, mm-hmm. or in, in the case of Syria having some, you know a dictatorship like that of the Assads, again mm-hmm. blocking everything. Sadiq Jalal Al Azam, ever the optimist. Thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>